few artists divide popular and critical opinion the way that Taylor Swift does. So pervasive is her self-driven and perpetually rewritten narrative, so impenetrable the wall of static thrown up by both her hyper-commoditized fans who adore her because she affirms them or at least sponsors a cult around which they can engage in mutual uncritical affirmation which represents the far ends of such post-millennial concepts as extreme neoliberalism, group narcissism, insert villain here derangement syndrome and super diversity by fellow artists who need a coattail to ride and the media who fear her vengeful and vituperative reputation. There seems to be no mass focus to analyse or appreciate her, apart from intersectional feminists who criticise her as an emblem of dilettante white feminism and they have a point, and certain sections of the LGBTQIA plus movement which call her out for only allying when it was mainstream to do so and no one focuses on her music which seems to be universally and uncritically accepted as infallible. As I mentioned above, no one in the industry wants to make an enemy of her. Also, for someone as famous as Swift, one would think the task of researching her video like this would be easy. Oddly no, because she controls her whole narrative and is powerful enough to have a pliant and fearful media excise any part of it which is inconvenient or embarrassing to her. So this, allied to a huge cult of followers who pride themselves on an attack dog mentality, make her her own very unreliable narrator. Couple that with her being perhaps the most powerful artist in the industry for a hundred years, and it makes for a disturbing precedent. Well, she can send in the black helicopters if she wants, but here's at least an attempt at a critical review. All of Taylor's seven disc discography rated worst to best. Number seven, Taylor Swift, 2006. The one truly awful entry in her catalog, Swift manages a collection of unsubtle songs which lyrically lay down the themes that dominate her career, the assumption of perpetual victimhood, the lack of personal agency, the absolute lack of solidarity with or empathy for other women who share her travails, the dastardly nature of conniving men, and the use of her platform to unload upon these faceless schlubs who've wronged her. The music is a mismatch of terribly generic country and Americana tropes, yearning to sound authentic but actually sounding like it was assembled by samples. Smith's voice is thin and while she tries gamely, unexpressive and for some reason she feels the need to dot a bewildering variety of local yokel accents that vary wildly from song to song. Because of the limitations on her voice, the melodies are droning and samey. Best songs? At a pinch, at least, picture to burn as Sprite being a bit feisty, although how the LGBTQIA plus community hasn't torn it to shreds for the gay slur and the lyric, I don't know. Probably they know that a powerful friend is better than needlessly making a powerful enemy. Worst songs, of which there are plenty, Should Have Said No is especially odious, and Our Song is about as ham-fisted and cliched as the title implies. I could go on for a while yet, but let's just leave it at this is a horrid, horrid album, and listening to it was constantly unpleasant. Number 6. Fearless from 2008. Swift's second album, while still far from her best work, is a massive improvement over her accursed debut. Gone are the faux good old girl affectations and the jumble sale production, and in is a clearer, less cluttered sound. Jump and Fall is a darn good song, several orders of magnitude better than anything on the first album with its clear pop rock leanings. Fearless and White Horse are also mixtape worthy. Worst songs, there are still missteps aplenty. The particularly putrid Forever and Always, a Love Story, which has a rapey vibe and seems uh, oblivious to the fact that Romeo and Juliet killed themselves in the end, and 15, which to my ears drips with cynicism. But then, I'm not 15. What the album does do is confirm the one positive dimly visible in the debut. Assuming that it is her that does it, the gal can write a pop hook 
and knows how, within the limitations of her voice, to make it count. Credit to her for making such a good go on her second album. Number 5. Reputation 2017 Reputation is not as bad as some folks would have you think it. It arrived at a time when Swift's public stocks were at an all-time low, fueled by a media burned out by the constant publicity and drama overload that 1989 generated, and the familiar bind of an artist finding themselves damned if they embraced change and damned if they did not. This is effectively the record where she lost any vestiges of that hard-won pop past through Red in 1989. She lost her teeny pop fan base, or at least forced it to grow up, and refreshingly, she lost her mind. It's also the first album it becomes impossible to consider as a creation of Taylor Swift the artist before you consider it as a creation of Taylor Swift the media confection. Thus, it's not a record as much as it is a fashion accessory, an accoutrement of fandom, and a symbol of fealty. Musically, in its way, it's very similar to the first album, but unlike the Colour by Numbers debut, Reputation is a willfully unpredictable beast. Amidst the usual clatter clank and crapola from Max Miller, there are some pretty good songs. Delicate, although the mix is poor, Getaway Car, So It Goes, Ready For It with its catchy chorus as one of the few reminders of 1989, Call It What You Want To somehow manages to dodge the Max Millerisms as does New Year's Day, which sounds like it was recorded on a cassette player and sounds very much the better for it. Worst songs? Endgame is pure trash, featuring some C-lister rapper and the unctuous and pointless Ed Sheeran. I Did Something Bad, which is like a kung fu movie, so awful it's almost good and has the most hilariously wrong-headed lyrics. Her self-pity and perpetually assumed victimhood, all big resonators with her cult, remain as strongly and pathetic as they did on the first album. Don't Blame Me, which may well be two songs stitched together, is ridiculous and makes a mockery of any claim she might have to being a feminist. Look at What You Made Me Do is a headache to wade through and This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things is one of the most eloquent statements on how a little rich girl feels when her princess syndrome is violated. Reputation, if it lost its worst four songs, would be a very presentable 40 minute, 40 second album which would make better, cohesive narrative sense. But in the case of Reputation, it's its flaws that make it unique as long as you don't take them seriously. Number four, Red, 2012. The album which I imagine most people think of when they think of the standard Taylor Swift trope. The perpetually wronged woman, the pure heart sullied by blackguards and villains. Red suffers, like all the albums we've reviewed here, of being overlong, overstuffed, and the strong songs being diluted by the weak ones. Overseen by now no fewer than nine producers, there's still a very few passing winks to country, but this album seems to be designed to show off every facet of Swift as a performer and veers into hard pop territory far more often than not. But Red it does have more than its share of good songs, such as the rocking open of State of Grace, the early 80s AM vibe of Treacherous, the deliberately ridiculous 22, Stay Stay Stay, which is fun despite her trying her hardest to sound like Miranda Lambert. After Stay Stay Stay, the album does fall away badly into plodding rockers and unconvincing ballads. Until we get to Begin Again, a slow country song which closes the album and is an outlier. A ballad with the positivity the rest of the album generally. Number 3. 1989 from 2014 this should be a terrible album, but it's not. It's actually quite fun. Swift is completely adrift from even the altered realities of Red. 
but sheer chutzpah and her bringing her A-game to the one string she has left in her bow, that being she knows a hook when she hears it. Musically, there's very little here which isn't obviously the work of any of the nine additional producers yet. Swift, through her presence and infectious sense of fun and drama, is very much in the album. Not the cipher she was to make herself out to be on reputation. But it's pop, it's a bit of dark dance, a bit of early 80s throwback, and a lot of big sounding noises which ultimately say little. It's an already dating artifact of its time. There are also some good songs on it. It kicks off with the double killers Welcome to New York and Blank Space, which is, if not the best, certainly the funniest, most self-aware and cleverest song she's ever written. All You Had to Do Was Stay is a superior finger pointer and an evil ex-boyfriend where all her problems would be solved if he just undid whatever he felt he had to do at the time. The lack of personal agency in it is staggering. Shake It Off is possibly the most annoying song ever written, but then Tequila, Surf and Bird and The Girl from Ipanema are all annoying, and they're masterpieces of Western culture. I Wish You Would manages to transcend a completely off-base arrangement with this energy and tunefulness. How You Get the Girl, which sounds like it came off Speak Now, is okay. And the Imogen Heap collaboration, Clean, is great, but it shouldn't be closing the album. Perhaps How You Get the Girl would have been a better party song to close a party album. Low Points, the equal parts tuneless and clueless bad blood. This Love, which is like Bratwurst, it tastes okay but you don't want to think about how it was made. And New Romantics is a bit silly and not in a charming way. It feels like an honest record. For all its faults in her usual narrative weaknesses, Taylor is the victim, not just of greasy-hearted men but of bullies, which is another key trigger to her massive cult. Her denigration of fellow female artists and her advocacy of the white feminism. This is the kind of record that the overindulged daughter of millionaire parents who grew up on a Christmas tree farm was born to make. Number two, Lover from 2019. Let's call this her sprawling double album. As usual, all of the typical Taylor critical tropes exist here on an album where her very good and her wretched intermingle most freely. Lover is to reputation as Blonde on Blonde is to Highway 61 Revisited. Bigger, bolder, better crafted and considerably less deranged. The child of a mere five outside producers, it values Songcraft more than any album since Red and Swift does rise to the occasion. The title track is one of the very best records she's ever made. Great song, great arrangement, great vocal. Soon You Will Get Better, with this country throwback, is another one of her superior songs. The Archer is another interesting song that gets lost in the vastness of the record. I Think He Knows and Paper Rings are solid and it sounds good to hear actual musical instruments being played again on one of her records. False God is good, but Cruel Summer, while a good song, gets lost in its overproduction. You Need to Calm Down is a solid bop, but as a narrative it fails. It conflates Swift's own self-pitying with the LGBTQIA plus issues it purports very limply to put forward. Ten years too late. Her attempt at AAVE is also hilarious. And face it, she's not going to win a single gay fan off Beyonce. I mean, really, she's bringing a knife to a gunfight there. Daylight is a fair closer, relying on cliched lyrics, but it's well arranged and produced. As for the worst, the man is ridiculous and frankly insulting to every woman who's ever actually done some work to try and bridge gender gaps. Miss Americana is barely comprehensible gibberish. Well, what's that all about? If anyone can tell me, I would be indebted to know. I'd be happy to forget that I forgot that you existed ever existed. And me is rotten. It's every bit as annoying as Shake It Off, but nowhere near as earwormy. Lover isn't really an album of advancement. It's more one of retrenchment and flanking. There is a way forward in this and it lies in the sections where she reaches back and finds echoes of her older music and song craft and manages to invest them with a sincerity they lacked in their previous iterations. 
Lover augurs well for Taylor's future. Number one, Speak Now from 2010. The centre of Taylor Swift's artistic universe has always been Taylor Swift. Cosseted by an uncritical and fiercely parochial online community and a phalanx of producers, she strikes me not as being the kind of girl who will one day suddenly listen to Blue or Tapestry or even Bad Reputation and go, holy, I've been wasting my life. Which means, for someone who exists in several idioms, for her to do her best work, she has to be her best Taylor Swift. She came close on 1989, but she absolutely hits the mark on Speak Now. This is a fantastic album. Alternately cocky and vulnerable, always tuneful, it's the album where the thematic seeds sown in Fearless came to bear fruit before turning into the weeds that choked the life out of Red and descended into a hateful paranoia by reputation. Musically, it's her last single producer album to date, Nathan Chapman returning to the helmsman's chair. The album continues the same curve as Fearless, trending to pop and country rock, but still makes an effort to hold on to the 12 to 13 year old market from her butterflies on the album cover period. There's very much good and very little ill on the album. It's her only album which manages to string together a run of absolute killer songs. Four stormers right at the top of the album. Mine, Sparks Fly, Back to December, where she actually, for the first and possibly only time, shows remorse for her mistakes and apologises for them. And the fantastic title track. The terrific and ruthlessly vitriolic Better Than Revenge is wicked rocking fun, and the album closer, the blindingly brilliantly stupid Long Live is Perfect. On the debit side, the notorious Dear John, which rambles on for the best part of seven minutes, frankly doesn't repay the investment. If mean is to be taken literally, it sends a very poor message to young women about their lack of agency. It seems to trivialise abuse, and worryingly, given the size of the cult of the disenfranchised Swift was attracting, that is not what vulnerable people need to be hearing. And the last third of the album does have a few songs devoted to the Butterflies crowd, which aren't especially of interest to the classic rocker. The biggest issue with the record is, as usual for Swift, there's way too much crammed into it for it to consistently hold the attention. Plus, in this case, the individual songs go on for too long. It's hard to believe that an album this well-crafted, well-shaded and great-sounded could be put together by the same producer who fumbled about trying to find a direction on her first album. The truth is, Speak Now is simply one of the best albums of the last 10 years because it is what a good pop album should be. So, 14 years and 7 albums, what to make of Taylor Swift? Like every artist, she has her good points and her not so good. Like every other artist as well, her, her business teams and her fans' motivations all seem to blur together. It's just with her it seems to be on such a grand scale. And this is one of the two great Mars upon her legacy. She presents as the classic millennial media brat, demanding attention and unconditional praise for her efforts and incapable of accepting the consequences of doing so. This is reinforced by the remarkable circumstances of her upbringing, acting as a spoiled child no one has ever said no to, and every time someone backs down to her, it just reinforces the outrage against those who stand up to her. She appears to, however, have met her match in a very ill-judged record contract that her people would have signed for her back in 2006. And who signs a 13-year record contract and doesn't renegotiate it when she becomes the biggest star on the planet? Her biggest demerit is, however, her tacit encouragement of or failure to explicitly discourage her online cult to pressure and terrorise targets of her ire, especially when they cross the line into real-life action, which is a huge concern. I'm sure that the most perfunctory of Google searches will reveal notorious incidents where this happens, and it reflects very badly on her, but it's usually downplayed by a pliant, soft-pedalling and left-sympathetic media. So, she's dubious with everything except the music. How does she fare with the music? 
Let's be positive. For a person judging her from the classic rock standards and critical principles, her best work stands up as well as anyone's better perhaps over the length of her career. Her best songs are sharp, witty, hooky. She can punch them out and, with the exception of her debut, spread right over her catalogue. She puts on a heck of a live show and she works hard for the money she makes. That's her best work. Her problem, and that's the thing that stops albums like Fearless, Red and 1989 from being great albums, and not just good to very good, and what stops Speak Now from just being a best album of its time to one of the best albums of a generation is that she has no filter. Everything has to go onto the album which leads to records that don't hold the attention and a wildly inconsistent quality. To the listener brought up on classic rock, though, a greatest hits picked by a classic rock listener, not a cult member, I think would be impressive to even the hardest to impress rocker. Another positive is, and it's one I kind of like, is that like the rock acts of old, a Taylor Swift album release is an event, just like when the Stones or the Who or Pink Floyd used to put one out. Who else can you say that about these days? To write twice as many words on the manipulation of her public image as on her music may suggest something. And there seem to be a large number of people out there waiting for Taylor to experience some kind of grand comeuppance in the future. But I'm not. Even if the cult drifted away and the stadium tours were downgraded, she's a good enough songwriter and a clever enough performer to make great music. She's proven that, and I'm looking forward to her next move.